Good morning, Mr. Hi, Hansen. Uh, I want to thank you for agreeing to be participate in our oral history program. Um, this is an interview for the Purdue University's oral history program. Today's date is May 31st, 2016. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration at Purdue University Libraries, Archives and Special Collections. Today I'm interviewing Mr. Daniel Hampton Sr. Thank you again for participating in our program. It's, it's an honor. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's, our, it's, our, it's our honor. I'd want to start with asking you about your formative years. So could you tell us a little bit about where you grew up, sure. um, your high school, and how you ended up um, did you, going to college and in the military? Okay, well, uh, born in a remote part of northern New Mexico called Springer, up around the Raton Pass. There's a big ski area up there right now. And my family moved to Albuquerque in 1940. Uh, my dad got a job in the, in the defense industry <laughs> before the war. Oh, really? And uh, so I grew up in Albuquerque with all the atomic energy stuff going on that we not, didn't really know much about. Mm -hmm. Kind of an exciting time because there were a lot of Easterners, very sharp people coming to the state to work on the, uh, the program. And the only way you could get to Los Alamos was to fly into Albuquerque. And so there was a lot of related activity in Albuquerque, a lot of research stuff going on out at uh, the Kirkland Air Force Base. In fact, there was a bomber wing at the uh, training wing at the Kirkland Air Force Base. So even as a small kid, I got to go out to the end of the runway and lot, oh. watch lots of World War II airplanes coming in, taking off, flying training missions and everything. So I, I guess I got <laughs> aviation in my blood very, very early. What and did your dad do? Well, uh, he was a welder, actually, and a machinist, uh, and a mechanic, uh, and um, uh, so he got a job welding some very, very big tanks, uh, spherical and, and cylindrical tanks for, I guess, storage or buoys or I'm not sure what, but mm -hmm. it was a good job in those days. Yeah. And so, and so the university was, uh, University of New Mexico, where I later attended, was about a quarter of a mile from home. <clears throat> and to uh, get to any of my schools, I had to go right through the university. Uh -huh. So either on the bus, on my bike, or walking, or riding with, with friends or whatever. So I got attracted to the university really, really, really early. And it was just part of life. Yeah, you sort of grew up there. Just grew up there, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was just right there. So uh, I went to uh, uh, the second high school in, in Albuquerque, took a lot of science and space, or science and engineering and math courses. wasn't very good in those days at that, but uh, managed to uh, have a good enough grade point average to get into the engineering department at the University of Mexico, and I majored in electrical engineering. Okay. Thought about being an architect, but uh, uh, decided that uh, electronics was uh, a new and upcoming field, and it was just very, very uh, challenging to, to go ahead into that, so that's what I did. And I can still remember that fateful October day in 1957 where one night we looked up and here's this blinking thing going over the top of town and that was Sputnik. Sputnik yeah. And I and my friends were always remarking, well gee, I wonder what that'll do to our career. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> but that was a uh, very, very challenging. Of course, they, uh, by that time at Kirkland they were doing a lot of, of uh, nuclear weapons uh, uh, training and uh, mating of the weapons to new airplanes. Mm -hmm. So we got to see every possible airplane that the Air Force and the Navy had come in there for uh, combat compatibility mm -hmm. uh, training and, and uh, all that with, the, with their uh, weapons to the airplane. So mm -hmm. just a lot of aviation. And of course, Albuquerque in the early days of aviation was on one of the main uh, electronic highways, east coast to west coast. And so we had a lot of airplanes going through there all the time. And mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it became an airline hub. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I remember right after Pearl Harbor, uh, two, three days later, a very quietly unmarked brown DC-3 landed for refueling, and it had the entire Japanese delegation in it wow. from the Washington Embassy going to San Francisco to be escorted safely out of the country. So it was kind of interesting to have, you know, yeah. well, it was a big secret because the whole town showed up to see, to see the thing. I was going to say, how did you find out? <laughs> you know, the, the, the secrets in those days were kind of loose. Right. <laughs> so right. It was a small town. It was, it was a small town, right. So. Yeah. 
So then I graduated in 1958 and, um, and actually had gotten almost an intern job in, in the latter part of 1957, got my first security clearance and was working for a company in Albuquerque that was doing uh, what we would call system analysis right now. It was uh, writing troubleshooting manuals, putting together schematics, uh, and, and creating all sorts of training manuals for uh, an Air Force program called the Jupiter C. Uh, Jupiter C became the first nuclear tipped medium range ballistic missile in the Air Force inventory. But it was based on uh, a little older uh, technology called Redstone, and Redstone was one of Werner von Braun's rocket uh, programs. Uh, one version or another of Redstone or Jupiter C put the first monkey in space, right. launched the Explorer, I think Explorers 1, 3, and 4, and uh, then did uh, a bunch of, uh, of other research on reentry vehicles. So we got the challenge of putting together from schematic diagrams that were put together in Huntsville, Alabama by Germans who didn't speak English. They drew diagrams out on butcher paper. Uh, somebody translated them and we got boxcar full of these things, literally, to try to put together, put English on it, and create it in an Air Force technical manual <coughs> format so that the, the troops could use it to actually launch the missiles. Wow, so, so literally they came in, these, these drawings came in. It came in, in a boxcar. We got a boxcar about every three months. And, you and we to had to unroll them and glue them together and figure out, you know, the different systems, how they worked, and, and write the manuals on how to, how to use them, how to fire them, <laughs> how to troubleshoot them. It was a great job right out of college. Cause it was, you, yeah. You know, it's just really great. And what company was it? Uh, I think it was Lytle, L-Y-D-L-E, Lytle Engineering in Albuquerque, and they wrote uh, pilot manuals for the Air Force, mm -hmm. and they got this missile uh, contract, and so it just couldn't have been a greater job uh, yeah. right out of college, and I was waiting for my wife to graduate so we could be married, and uh, so I got to stay right there in, at home Perfect. and work on these. Um, and it was really very exciting, and, and I, again, 1957, from that time until I retired about, what, three years ago. I, had a, I consistently had a security clearance of one kind or another for, what, almost 50 years. So wow. it's, uh, it's uh, just been very interesting to see all of that. You got off on the right foot and the right job. The uh, Germans, as a part of uh, creating these things, these uh, diagrams and, and the missiles themselves, uh, in those days they, they built what was known as an iron bird uh, to make sure that everything worked. They, didn't, they weren't constrained by putting the components in a missile. They laid them out on a hangar floor, and they used great big thick copper wire, maybe a half inch to an inch in diameter, so that there were no ground loops or no extraneous things going on. They made sure that everything worked, the components worked, laid out without the constraints of being inside the, the missile tube. And then that's what they made the schematics of was from their experience of making everything working on a hangar floor. I see. And that was a, a logical step uh, in the systems engineering of thing. Well, let's make sure all the components work, then we'll worry about putting them together in a, in a tube. Right. So um, that was kind of interesting to see all that. And again, they, they had a lot of butcher paper, and a lot of big pens, and <laughs> lots of diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> did you go to Huntsville? At no, all I didn't go to Huntsville then. I, I did some business later in my career with the Army, and I think I actually found the old hangar that was still there. The government never gives away much, and that, that building had been refurbished. But uh, yeah, it was. We had some people go down there, and we had photographs of it. So it was uh, quite an interesting time, particularly uh, dealing with some of the words were not translatable, so we had a lot of German words, and we had to figure out what they meant. And then write them up in a handbook and give them to the Air Force, and they'd go try it out and come back and we'd revise it all. So, right. and then they deployed those missiles to Turkey, I believe, mm -hmm. eventually. So, mm -hmm. so about that time, I uh, went into the Marine Corps and uh, uh, became a fighter, uh, a fighter pilot. Uh, was stationed at Cherry Point, North Carolina, flying A4s, <coughs> and it was interesting with all of the. Um, Nuclear work in Albuquerque, I got, became a qualified nuclear delivery pilot. So uh, some of the uh, uh, things that I had seen in and around Albuquerque, and one summer job I had, I actually worked in a, a bomb factory in Albuquerque that built everything but the, the nuclear stuff. And 
four to five years later, I was actually flying around with an airplane that had a bomb that came out of that factory. Wow. So was that during college? Or no, uh, a yes, summer I job? had a summer job, yeah, yeah. As, a, as a summer intern, and uh, got, got to see a lot of uh, all the components that went into these tactical bombs. So small world, there was the same yeah. kind of weapon that I saw that we were making in that place. Right. <coughs> so, <coughs> so we spent two years uh, about at Cherry Point, North Carolina, after flight training, and. Um, Oh, I want to ask you about flight training. Okay, sure, go ahead. Because remember, when you were here the last time, we had the Neil Armstrong oh, yes. and Eugene Cernan exhibit up, and Neil had saved some of those photographs of his uh, naval training in the big tank, the big pool. The big pool. And well, I that was remember yes, what you said that was called. Well, um, we had a couple of things. They had a they had a hundred yard long Olympic pool, and uh, the Navy trained you very well uh, to. Uh, be able to react to any kind of emergency, and a lot of emergencies would uh, require you leaping out of an airplane one way or another and floating down into the water at sea. And a couple things can happen when you're at sea if you're, the wind can rock you back and forth and you can land on your back, on your face, or feet down. So they had one uh, trainer that um, hoisted you up about 50 feet above the pool and started to swinging you. And then in some random fashion, the instructor would let you go so you would get used to landing face first, back first, or straight down, you know, which you would never know what you were going to do at sea, particularly if it was at night. So that was one of them. Uh, another one was is if you actually landed in the water, the parachute could be caught by the wind and you could be drugged face down and drown. So the, the name of this uh, trainer was uh, just survived for 30 seconds because they determined that I think it takes you something like 35 seconds to drown. And this uh, uh, trainer uh, had us in our harnesses with a winch at the end of this 100 yard long pool and they could drag you face down for 30 seconds without drowning you. And, and you had your, your leather gloves on, we had our leather gloves on. And of course they get wet and they're very slippery and you've got uh, two or three points of uh, connection to the harness. So while you're dragged face down, uh, at a pretty good speed, that's probably about 20 miles an hour, you've got to be able to have enough sense to disconnect yourself and throw yourself <coughs> free of the harness before you hit the other end. Yeah. Uh, so most of us got to do all of these things twice. Okay. You know, it just it was a very rare person that got it right the first time because it was just so new. Now, I think the one you're talking about is called a Dilbert Dunker. Yes. And uh, it's a, a big high platform and an old World War II cockpit with a parachute that instead of having a parachute in it, it had a great big block of uh, balsa wood to simulate the air that was trapped in the parachute. Because when you're upside down trying to get out, the air in the parachute would act as sort of buoyancy and try to push you into the seat, but you're upside down and so you've got to overcome the force of the air trying to entrap in the parachute. So instead of putting a parachute in there, and a balsa wood block that simulated that. And so you're sitting in this uh, simulated cockpit and they make you, uh, you know, with one hand on the throttle and one hand on the stick, and it goes over the edge, it's a 45 degree angle down and a great big bungee that accelerates you into the water. And when the, the, the front end hits the water, the back end releases and it flips upside down. So you're now trapped in an airplane that's sinking to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, essentially. It only goes down about 20 or 30 feet. And um, you, the instructions are very plain. Wait until the bubbles clear, because there's a lot of air in train, and if you try to work your way through all those bubbles, um, you can't, uh, you, you may not make it. So you wait until all the bubbles are free, and that takes about two seconds. Meantime, you continue to sink. <laughs> Panic. And, and, panic. And, and control the panic and then what you have to do is you have to pull pull yourself down and then if the, this is supposed to have been a World War II airplane so the wings are out at 90 degrees they tell you there is a hot engine right in front of you that has just been immersed in very cold water and so it may blow up at any time so you don't want to go forward because you're going to run into a hot engine that may blow up you can't go off to either side because the wing is there and you're going to hit your head and that's not going to be too good. You can't go straight back because the empennage is back there. So while you're going to, sinking to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, you have to have enough sense to pull yourself straight down and then go backwards at 45 degrees wow. to miss everything and then come up to the top. 
Now again, they know it takes 35 seconds to drown, and in uh, 25 seconds they can reverse the process and haul you out of there, choking and half half drown. And they, they always had one or two uh, divers in the water in case you really got tangled up, and, and, and they were the ones that would signal them to drag it, you back up. I never had to get drugged back up, but I did get to do it three times. Oh. Most people do it more than that, and one poor guy that we can recall was a pretty smart guy. He just couldn't get it, and so he got to do the Dilbert Dunker four times a day for three weeks until he got it. They needed pilots badly back then, and he was a good student otherwise. They wanted right. him, but he just couldn't. You know, he hit the wing, both sides, he hit the engine, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it's fairly disorienting, and, and that's yeah. a lot of what the astronauts had to do is, you know, learn how to function under those disorienting conditions. Yeah. So I, I will just say that everything that um, I ever encountered while I was flying, uh, the Navy training had prepared us for all of that, ejection training and all those sorts of things. I actually got to, had to eject out of a, a Marine airplane. Uh, before uh, about two years later and the training was all very well you know mm -hmm. done for us we knew what to expect and all that so they prepared you very well mm -hmm. uh, they also uh, had a, a an airplane that uh, was just half of it with the real engine in it and they taught us how to leap out of the airplane into the slipstream and uh, actually miss the wing wow. so that was part of the training you bail out and, and again go to the back and we had the real engine there, and it just made all the noise and had all the wind blowing over it, and it blew us back into a big net. So, wow. very, very realistic and thorough, thorough training. And uh, where was that training? Was that in Pensacola, Pensacola? Florida? Uh -huh. Okay, so Pensacola, you went down there. Went down to Pensacola. Yeah, yeah, that was a great place. Yeah. So we <laughs> wow. So that was nineteen. Uh, nineteen fifty nine is when we were in flight training, right? Mm -hmm. Graduated uh, in early in late sixty. And then went to Cherry Point, North Carolina for two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was avionics officer of the squadron and uh, learned a lot about uh, avionics, which was my double E degree. Said, well, I think I really would rather be involved in electronic sort of stuff. So we got out of the Marine Corps and went to uh, work for Honeywell, which is where I then got some experience in, in some of the real space program. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the first thing I got to work on was the X-20 Dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, uh, of course, at that time a classified program, but uh, it was known as a FOBS, a Fractional Orbital Bombardment System. And this uh, airplane, that, that, and I call it an airplane, really kind of was a pre predecessor of the space shuttle, but it was to be put into orbit with the bomb behind the pilot, and uh, it was supposed to re-enter, uh, and in the re-entry it would kind of bounce off one of the other upper layers of the atmosphere, let the bomb go and it would go back into orbit. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a way for us to get at the Russians. We never had to use it. Uh, but a very interesting program because the, um, the air airplane, all of the aerodynamic characteristics changed with temperature. Normally altitude and speed are two things that, that uh, determine a lot about how an airplane can be maneuvered and controlled. Uh, this one had another variable, which was speed, and the airplane, is, uh, the, uh, the X-20 itself had a series of layers of titanium that could expand as the airplane got hot. Well, as it did, the shape of the wing changed, hmm. and so all the aerodynamic characteristics changed. So the research that was going on, and then we built a flight control system at Honeywell around that, was how you could control this thing as it came in uh, for that sort of bounce and skip to drop its bomb and then go back into orbit. And then, it, of course, it had to re-entry and re-enter, and you had to be able to uh, control it during re-entry. So uh, very interesting, again, the first chance out for uh, working on part of a flight control system to learn about all these aerodynamic um, intricacies was really quite a challenge, and I, I got a real good education uh, about all that. The program was killed because um, one, the bomber, the, the uh, X-20 itself was too heavy, or the Boeing launch rocket was not capable enough, or the government decided to kill the program and put it into the classified world. I don't know, I never really knew mm -hmm. uh, what happened, but it was interesting that after uh, the X-20 disappeared, uh, it wasn't too far down the line that we ended up with a space shuttle that uh, looks a little bit like it. <laughs> 
it, it doesn't have, it had tiles on it that uh, were ablative and, and uh, would, uh, would kind of burn up instead of the layered metal, but the uh, mm -hmm. same kind of an idea, this was something that was reusable that would come back in, mm -hmm. you had to control it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just looking through the latest issue of Aerospace Magazine from the AIAA and the Defense Research Projects Administration, DARPA, has got uh, a new hypersonic re-entry thing that will launch uh, kinetic weapons from space at very select targets. And that all sounds very dinosaur to me. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so it was a concept that <laughs> well, was right on. Well, some basic technology yeah. that was really right on. Um, Honeywell was a fun place to work uh, in those days. They really took good care of their engineers. And they didn't have very many people who had recent flying experience. I'd been a maintenance test officer in my squadron. <clears throat> and so one of the first things I did while I was getting oriented in dinosaur, one day they called me downstairs and there was this great big funny looking teardrop thing made out of plywood in a great big computer lab downstairs and it was the first plywood mock-up of the Apollo re-entry vehicle, uh, the command module, and it was powered uh, by a brand new digital computer from DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, called the PDP-1 and it was the first simulation of how you're going to re-enter and, and uh, not burn up. So they hauled me in and said, well, oh, you were a maintenance test pilot, you can be our test pilot. Uh, why don't you see if you can fly a re-entry on this thing? I didn't know anything about that. Unbeknownst to me, uh, some of the engineers down there had some little tubing piped into the instrument panel, and almost everybody that flew this thing trying to do the first re-entry would, quote, burn up. Uh, you do it wrong, and when you burned up, somebody blew cigarette smoke through there, so you, oh. ended, you ended up with a co cockpit full of smoke. So that was that was kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> but we did a lot of simulation, of course, and uh, the, the PDP-1 was one of the simulator, one of the better uh, um, computers at the time for simulation. So. How so, long did you work on that? Well, uh, I was at, we were at Honeywell for two years, uh, about two years. It was just so cold up there. We come from North Carolina, and we're from the Southwest, so we moved on to Phoenix and went to work for uh, Motorola, working on a, a couple of programs uh, that have since become digital data uh, transmission programs on the health of airplanes. The commercial aviation industry is using these so that uh, before airplanes go on transatlantic or transpacific flights, uh, you've got a, a pretty good indication from the data you've collected that the airplane's going to make it over the ocean. But at those at that point in time, we barely had digital computers, so uh, a lot of technology involved in trying to create uh, uh, systems that monitor those things. Mm -hmm. um, I was working on a master's degree at that point in time and had uh, made some contacts at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for data for my master's thesis, and the folks at uh, Sperry across town in Phoenix, uh, f uh, flight systems people, found out from the Air Force that I was at Motorola, they said, why? Why don't you come over here and work for us on real things like uh, glass cockpits and uh, uh, heads up displays and other sorts of things. So I moved across town and started doing some of that. Uh, and that was interesting because this is more of the commercial side of aviation. Mm -hmm. And um, I got to work on a, um, a heads up display, the uh, 747 has just coming into airline service at that point in time. And if you've ever seen a 747, it's a very, very long airplane, and it's got a, a very high nose-up attitude. And uh, the first 747 Boeing sold went to Pan Am, and the chief test pilot of Pan Am, when he landed it the first time, blew out all the tires because he wasn't used to the high eyeball to to mm -hmm. runway height. Mm -hmm. He got a he got a concrete boot award for the privilege of blowing out all the tires. He said, "Well, gee, maybe." And he was a good pilot. Maybe we need to have a head-up display that will help our line pilots not blow out all the tires when they land. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that is? So well, head-up head display just is, uh, in in World War II airplanes. If you've ever seen uh, any of the movies, they got a little piece of glass up there, and there's a reticle on there that they use for gunnery so that they could, uh, it was called a lead computing gun sight, and it allowed you to lead the plane you were shooting at uh, enough so that you could actually hit it. Well, the idea with the uh, head-up display was the same kind of little glass, uh, uh, piece of glass in front of you, but it had landing parameters on it. It would give you your airspeed, your altitude, 
your direction and all that, so that you, and particularly your altitude, so that you wouldn't have to look down in the cockpit, and you could do a better job of managing the approach. And so we got to do a little bit of work on that. And about that point in time, Boeing, as I recall, uh, was uh, into the uh, supersonic transport competition. Boeing and Lockheed and Douglas all wanted to be in the supersonic transport business, so they all three had uh, had uh, various designs uh, to do that. And Sperry was one of the leaders uh, in producing a, uh, a glass cockpit that would allow the pilot to have what we call mode-dependent data. So you know, when you're taxiing, you don't need much information. So the display would only show what you needed to taxi. When you take off you need a certain amount of information. When you're at cruise, you need a certain amount of information. And uh, this airplane had an even higher car, uh, pilot eyeball to wheel height uh, distance, such that even uh, during landing, it would, it would be possible for the wheels of the airplane in, a, in a, a totally instrument approach to go visual before the pilot would. And so it was very much of a concern, well, how are you going to manage flying this thing? Uh, all of the little gauges that had been used during World War II and that were just proliferating through um, uh, commercial aviation had their limitations. They, more and more information was needed. People were inventing more and more sensors. You could only put so many of these gauges because there were mechanisms behind the gauges. There's only so much you could cram into a small package and they were all mechanical. They all had problems. They lagged or they took a lot of power. And so Sperry had the idea along with, I guess, maybe Collins, that we were ahead of the field. Maybe we could put that on a, on a cathode ray tube, like a TV tube, and you could create the, uh, the information, the data, uh, electronically and change it as needed during flight. So I got to be the project manager for that thing at Sperry and we had to develop the symbology. We had to uh, create uh, the, the mode dependency, uh, you know, protocol so that for what mode of flight you were in, you had the right type of information. Wow. And that was just a fascinating program because we were right at the limit of what semiconductors could do. Um, you had to be able to see this thing in a bright sun, sunlight at, you know, like 12 o'clock noon at uh, 10,000 feet over Phoenix, Arizona in the summer. It's very bright, <laughs> like it is in Denver. And so uh, there were lots of, uh, of technical problems with just the uh, technology of, of, of looking at a, at a screen. And uh, one little interesting story that came out of that is we were making a lot of good progress with this. Uh, we had an airplane that was configured for a, uh, uh, a demonstration model. We had actually had Gordon Cooper, one of the astronauts, come out and fly in it, and, and lots and lots of interest in this airplane and in this uh, in this. Uh, uh, instrumentation and uh, at one point in time everybody was interested in it and just like uh, an iron curtain fell over the aviation industry um, nobody was interested anymore and at a Society for Engineering Test Pilots meeting in, in uh, Seattle one night after I'd made a presentation about well here's what it does they had a big cocktail party afterwards and all the chief pilots of the airlines were there one of these guys was fairly emotional and had, unfortunately, had had a drink or two too much. And he said, your blasted, your blasted uh, TV tube is, is gonna sterilize me. What do you mean, sterilize me? Well, during World War II, he'd been a transport pilot, and Sperry had an engine analyzer uh, in a DC-6, and they didn't do a good job shielding the radiation. Oh. And there was a worry at that point in time that the X-ray radiation would actually sterilize the pilots. And this guy didn't bother to see that this was in front of him, not behind him. And, right. and so I said, you've got to be kidding me. No, he says, we're never going to do this. It's, it's just going to sterilize us. And we don't want that. So I actually had to, part of my research program was to go to the Loveless Clinic in Albuquerque and give them one of our test models and let them go do a, um, a radiation study of this thing. They were the space medicine folks. All the astronauts had to go through there to get uh, their flight physical. <clears throat> and I, for a long time I had a little two-page report, and it basically said uh, that the, uh, the radiation from the dial of the average pilot's Mickey, Mickey Mouse watch would do more damage to him than our tube would. 
And so and after that, everybody said, well, okay, that might be something we want to go do. So that's what was holding it up. So that was holding it up, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and so, so it, uh, once again, uh, got to be something that everybody wanted. And the idea was, uh, when they got that was, well, okay, if you could use that TV tube <clears throat> during, uh, during flight, uh, when you get into the instrument landing condition, again, the wheels could go visual before the cockpit. We actually put a TV tube, TV camera down where the wheels were. So when the wheels would go visual, then we were going to be working with the FAA to get uh, certification to use the picture from the wheel height as, as allowable to land in the minimum conditions of visibility. Mm -hmm. And so that was, uh, that was going to be another feature of this. So it, it had a lot of good things with it. Uh, the biggest problem was it was a cathode ray tube and there were a lot of limitations with the cathode ray tube. Um, but before we got to, to, to do much about solving all of that, then that program got canceled. Our government, um, I guess in my opinion, kind of chickened out on the technology because it was going to take a long time to, to, uh, to, to get it. And the French then created the Concorde and sort of had the high ground on commercial supersonic flights. Still have it because we don't have a supersonic transport uh, to this day. Um, a lot of technology from Boeing went into the B-1 that had the swing wing mm -hmm. and to uh, an Air Force bomber called the F-111. So it wasn't totally lost, but we, we lost the high ground of the French for, and, and still don't have it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so th that became the basis of the glass cockpit. All the simulation, uh, all the symbols that were moving around, the colors, and all, and then the um, uh, display technology changed from being cathode ray tubes to uh, what we have now, which are L, uh, LCDs. Mm -hmm. And so the electronics were caught up to the need, and so we now have in you know, widespread commercial and general aviation uh, glass cockpits, fairly inexpensive glass cockpits. And on any kind of information you want, the idea also was that you have, uh, you've got 100% sort of spares built in because your glass cockpit could be pulled out of the front and put in the co-pilots if his died. And then mm -hmm. in the meantime, they took all the instru engine instruments and uh, had a, a separate computer box that would generate all those. Well, the same display box would fit in all three places. Mm -hmm. So if any one of the displays died, you had two others that you could, under emergency conditions, plug in and still fly the airplane. Mm -hmm. So. It's, uh, it's, it's turned out to be a very, very good technology. But it's, uh, and widespread in uh, commercial aviation right now, we still don't have a supersonic transport. <laughs> so but you have the glass cockpit. We got the glass cockpit. Boy, that's we got you the know, glass something we take, it, or take for granted now. Oh, but you were at that transition point where. Well, it was like, in fact, it was kind of funny. Uh, on one early Saturday morning in a hot day in July, uh, the Aviation Week electronics editor came out for a flight. And in our little airplane, the one that Gordon Cooper got to fly in. What year was this? Oh, you? this would have been about 1970, and 1968, mm -hmm. 69, somewhere in there. And this guy was just a really good pilot and a really good editor. And unfortunately, even at 5.30 in the morning, the air over the hot Arizona desert is very bumpy. And nobody told the guy not to eat a big breakfast, and he oh, did. Yeah. And so about 10 minutes into the flight, demonstrating the magnificence of our display, he got sick and threw up. <laughs> and uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the quid pro quo for not letting the industry know that the avionics editor for Aviation Week got sick and threw up was he wrote a glowing article <laughs> for the magazine. I actually wrote most of it, and, and he edited it, and it was his byline. But right. it was a great, I still got reprints of that, a great two or three page thing about Sperry's work in, in glass cockpits all because this guy <laughs> didn't want to know he got air sick. <laughs> so, <laughs> good marketing tool. <laughs> right. And, uh, so, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, that's kind of where we were on all of that. That mm -hmm. was uh, just uh, very interesting to be a part of aviation for all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Great people working on all that. And <clears throat> government uh, involvement. They did, they did go ahead and make a military version out of it, I think. And it went into the F-15, mm -hmm. I believe it was one of the first airplanes. Uh, another interesting thing is that at, at Honeywell I got to do just a little bit of work on a side stick controller. 
that had been used in the F-15, again, just because I'd been a maintenance test pilot and I wanted somebody who kind of knew what that was about. And uh, our son ended up being a, a F-16 fighter pilot in both Gulf Wars. Wow. And the F-16's got a side stick controller that was derived from this thing that came off the F-15 wow. that I at least got to touch. <laughs> I at least got to touch it. And, 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 and so it was, that, was, that was a lot of fun. Oh, wow, yeah. So, so how long did you keep flying? Did you fly? Oh, I didn't fly. I know it was, I was in uh, two different graduate schools through the years and I was never any, anywhere that a, a, a Marine Reserve Squadron was. Yeah. We just never were there. And yeah. uh, they were always in some other place and had a family to raise and right. a career to work on and, and education to get. So I really didn't ever do any, any more flying. Right. Um, I, I did at Sperry a little bit. In fact, I used some GI Bill to get a uh, instructor's license and a multi-engine rating just because going along as sort of a quasi-demonstration pilot in our little demo airplane, mm -hmm. for, uh, I, I would need to fly once in a while to demonstrate the, the symbology and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I'd never flown an airplane that didn't have trim. All the airplanes I flew, military planes, had trim. And so when I went to get my uh, instructor's license, I flew a, a uh, Cessna 150. Didn't have any trim. And the instructor beside me had less flight time than I did, but he knew how to fly that airplane. Mm -hmm. I was so bad in that thing, they had to go to the VA actually and get a, a special uh, dispensation to double the amount of flight time I got because I didn't know how to fly an airplane that didn't have trim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, it was very humbling to <laughs> end up trying to do a loop and find yourself 90 degrees because you forgot about, you know, there's no trim. You got to do it with your feet. Right. <laughs> But I did learn a lot about uh, aer aerodynamics, probably more in that little Cessna 150 than I did flying any jet I ever flew. Oh, that's interesting. It's very unforgiving. <laughs> right. That's just foundation. And real basics. I mean, real basics. Yeah. <laughs> that's the foundation. Yes, right? it was. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, that uh, I don't know. That's just sort of a quick summary of uh, of all of this. It's. Uh, it's uh, been a fun career. Got to see a lot of aviation changes. Um, did a lot of work with that glass cockpit work on um, uh, what is now called uh, uh, zero zero landing, blind landing, category three C, where you actually fly down and land with uh, no visibility at all. And we practiced all of that in that in that uh, spirit demonstration airplane, just flying with the camera to prove that the uh, dynamics that got uh, broadcast through the camera to the, uh, the glass cockpit essentially gave you mm -hmm. enough uh, information so you could actually fly. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got to do, uh, got to do several, many, many, many of those. So, and that's pretty commonplace now mm -hmm. to fly category three landings mm -hmm. in commercial aviation. So, mm -hmm. amazing. Man can do a lot in a cockpit uh, <laughs> as long as he's got some good instrumentation. Right. And uh, you may not know um, that there's a big difference between commercial aviation in the U.S. and commercial aviation in Europe. Mm -hmm. Commercial aviation in Europe is sort of follows the German model that was kind of making its way through the space program in the early days where the Germans thought man didn't need to fly the machine. That's why they put a monkey into space. Mm -hmm. And in the movie The Right Stuff, if you recall, they had this big blow up with the scientists and got the man back in the loop and actually we would not have been able to have done what we did in space if we not had that man in the loop. Um, but uh, so aviation in Europe is very much that way. They're very more automated. Their flight control systems, ours are just as good, but our pilots fly and use the flight control system more as monitoring. The other way around, uh, the airplane is flown by the flight control system and the pilot does the monitoring. And there have been, a, and the Airbus air, aircraft particularly, uh, are very, very highly automated, and there have been some controversial crashes in the last 20 years where it is believed it's because, and particularly a couple of recent ones, where the pilots are insufficiently trained in how the system works. Mm -hmm. They know what is working fine, they just sit there and watch it, but they're not used to flying the airplane. They're not trained to fly the airplane like we're in the United States. I guess that's because of our independence. Mm -hmm. And our pilots always want to be the guy that's, uh, or, or lady in that, in that, in that, who have got control of that airplane. Right. And I think man in the loop is, is a good thing to do, but man's got to be in the loop, not the other way around. Right. And uh, in Europe, they, uh, they fly <coughs> regularly 
uh, Category 3 landings, uh, auto, totally automated. Uh, in our country, I'm not sure that we do that so much. The pilot is usually in command, and he's mm -hmm. got all the systems there, but he's, he's pretty well right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And so the best attributes of both the pilot and the system mm -hmm. and the Western way of flying versus in the European way of flying, well, we don't, we don't trust the man. Mm -hmm. We don't trust the man. We're going to make the system automated. Mm -hmm. And there's limits to what automation can do. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you, um, for any young engineers, what, what advice would you have or what uh, your career has been so long? Well, a couple things. Uh, obviously, uh, you've got to really have a good math background. Mm -hmm. And um, I would always... I would always recommend some real good understanding of systems, the overall stuff, because even if you just want to be an expert on a, I don't know, a valve actuator or a display or whatever, you really need to know, to, to do that job right, you need to know how it fits into the bigger thing. So I was really blessed, you know, to start off as a systems engineer doing those diagrams, so it was always the big picture. Right. Then I flew, and you get a perspective from flying, on the big picture, and then uh, most of the work I, I did from then on, I was one or uh, one way or another a systems engineer, mm -hmm. and so I think the bigger picture informs the design much better of the components, mm -hmm. and of course a good math background these days, of course computers, simulation, and all that, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, is very important to have. We didn't have all those good computers in those days. We had analog, sometimes hybrid computers. We did a lot of calculations by hand, so we were forced to understand the basics right. of the math, at least, which I think is good. Um, a lot of engineering uh, formulas that engineers, young engineers are given to use are kind of uh, extrapolated for, for uh, steady state conditions under limited conditions, mm -hmm. limited parameters. Well, okay, for so if you end up like the, on dinosaur, there's another variable. It's temperature. Now what do you do? Okay, so you need to really understand the bigger picture and the math of all of that. Secondly, uh, you're always going to be part of some kind of a team. Uh, I've certainly had a lot of hard-learned lessons about how to get along with people. Uh, so, uh, you know, you just can't be uh, in isolation. You can't be arrogant. It is a team environment more than ever these days. Mm -hmm. And so they need to do uh, have some good activities, I think. They need to participate in other things. Uh, they need to be more of a total person uh, because you're going to have a boss, and you may have a good boss, you may have a bad boss. More than likely than not, it won't be a particularly good boss. <laughs> but from the boss's viewpoint, you know, you're a piece of raw material that may not be too good either initially. So <laughs> uh, there's a lot of human interaction and dynamics. I remember um, at Honeywell when we were working on the uh, on the dinosaur, uh, we had a brilliant aerodynamicist that was doing all that uh, temperature sensitive stuff for us, and uh, he wanted to have a, a simple cockpit simulator so he could work out some things, and he just wanted to put a little stick on a table and didn't have any rudder pedals and didn't have any instrument panel and he was just going to figure out everything. I said, well, you can't do that. I mean, this is going to be flown by some pretty uh, pretty high-powered test pilots, you need to have a cockpit simulator. Oh, wow, well, we don't need that. So I had to go tooth and, and, and toenail with this guy and actually uh, over, got to override him and we built a simple little wooden plywood cockpit that had an instrument panel and could, could uh, focus on what the pilot needed so that you know, could make best use of how he was going to fly and either. Well, that guy was mad at me until the day I left. And I thought, well, okay, now there's a good example. A brilliant guy. And got a lot of brilliant kids these days, but you know you got to be open to the yeah. the wider scope of how you use this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that simulator, at least ten years ago, was still a right field. They took it in several of our black boxes and took it when the contract ended. And I was back there on some other business. I actually saw it once. It still had it, so it had some. Amazing. It had some value. Yeah, it was painted the same color. Had all of our prototype hardware still in it, which again led me to believe that there was still some other things going on and uh, but you know the guy just uh, he never forgave me for it just <laughs> yeah. 
So we have to be open to other well, expertise. You got, yeah, you but know? particularly today with all the interdisciplinary yeah. things that are going on, there's so many other aspects of uh, science and engineering that are going to impact on what you do. Right. Just knowing the computer code is not going to be enough. It's just not going to be yeah. enough. Or, or you won't be able to do the best you can for your project or the company for yourself too, and ultimately for the customer. So uh, I, th I think young engineers need to be social. They need to get not only their own good education, but inter interdisciplinary, and they need to be able to relate to other folks mm -hmm. and work in a team environment. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenging, that's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big challenge. For any field, <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I would say is, is uh, we continue to, to get educated. Uh, I would not ever, I uh, think, uh, advise anybody to uh, go straight through to get a PhD. I got my uh, AA degree, work, flew, got my master's degree, working, and then uh, after another 10 years or so, got an MBA. And I always thought that the industrial experience along with the education, one well, may be a better student, may be a better uh, person receiving the education, yeah. much more practical. And uh, I remember on my master's degree, uh, I was at Arizona State, and that was that right field connection where I had some aerodynamic data. My professor was very theoretical. He had just invented some matrix algebra methodology that was brand new to the world, but it was all out here in hyperspace. I mean, it was all theory. Mm -hmm. And I applied it to something practical, like landing a, a vertical takeoff and landing an airplane. And it blew this guy away. He was just amazed that there was something practical came out of his theoretical work. <laughs> and he was so amazed, in fact, that he really okay. was a big help in getting me uh, through my oral exams. And we wrote three or four papers together. And, you know, it just, it was really good. And I later learned maybe part of that little piece of technology that I studied for vertical landing and things ended up in the uh, Marine Corps V-22, the, uh, what is that thing called? The V-22, uh, it's, uh, oh. uh, it's got a name. I don't know, it's a Marine Corps helicopter, the, the tilt wing. Harrier. The tilt. No, the, well that was, that was the jet. Oh. This is the one with the big rotors that tilt forward and it flies. Mm -hmm. But it's the V-22. Mm -hmm. so, so the practical application, I think, is always, is right. always good, if you can get to it. Cause that's what you get paid. Well, the Osprey. Osprey. That's it. Osprey. Good for you. Yeah, that's the Osprey. That's the Osprey. Uh, but again, it just blew the guy away that there was something practical about it. Well, why shouldn't it blow you away? I mean, you know, you've got the brain. In, you're doing this for a reason. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. Very good. Well, let's see. Um, I think we've covered a lot of the questions yeah. that I had thought of. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked you <coughs> or that we haven't talked about? Well, kind of where is all this going now? Yeah. Uh, I was just looking at, uh, again, I've taken Aviation Week for 50, 50 years or so, and they've got the, the uh, 100th anniversary issue oh. and the 100 most uh, interesting things that have happened to Aviation. Well, <laughs> one of them is the glass cockpit. Oh, that fantastic. was fun. Yeah, they've got uh, zero zero landing in here. That was fun. Um, several things on aerodynamics. And so you know, where does all this go? There's so much uh, in the future that uh, is uh, tied up in uh, simulation and uh, digital technology. I mean, you could do things um, in a simulation environment that you could even never even thought about before. Uh, and uh, Lots of uh, airline training is now done in simulation. It's better in many respects than actually being in the cockpit up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. Certainly cheaper and uh, it's safer. Uh, you can mm -hmm. find out people's latent tendencies to homicide much easier <laughs> in a simulator than you can in an airplane. And uh, in the meantime, it's more economical because it doesn't take the airplane out of revenue service. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, uh, an awful lot of creativity uh, is going to come out of, uh, of the future. People are going to, uh, again, the mind can think up some great things. We couldn't do a lot of it before because we didn't know how to implement stuff. Well, implementing now is, is all electronic, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, so 
so uh, where, where these young folks are going to take uh, the technology, where aerospace, where space, all that's going to go, I don't think anybody really knows right now because it really it's just unlimited. And we had to go through some very painful stepping stones, slow to develop our space program. Uh, and uh, now I think a, a, an awful lot of that's going to change because, again, we can simulate so much of it. We've got all this experience from our space program in space. Uh, I've always thought it's too bad that uh, space shuttle stopped when it did, uh, that we didn't go on with more Apollos. Uh, our national attention span is like a two-year-old sometimes, it seems. It's not very, not very long. Uh, we really need to get back in space in a big way. We need to go back to the moon and get that pretty well organized as an inter intermediate space station to Mars or wherever else we need to go. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, again, the high ground militarily is where you should be, and so we really ought to be on the moon. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that we will get that soon. So um, uh, it's just uh, the, the, the challenge will be to focus the the power of creative human brains that now can extend their thinking through simulation and electronic mm -hmm. technology to areas that we never even thought about. So, you know, if you start thinking about Star Trek type things, well, that's not too, that's not, that's not unheard of at all, mm -hmm. at least in my mind, that mm -hmm. you need some propulsion systems and ways to refrigerate people so they don't age while they're traveling there and back, and they're already thinking through some of that. But we need to be back in space. We mm -hmm. just absolutely need to. So, mm -hmm. and I've been this thrilled to see what the space telescopes have brought back mm -hmm. to us. All this search for other planets and what Hubble has done, and then this new Webb uh, telescope is going to be launched in a couple more years, something like that. And it's going to be um, Hubble on steroids. Amazing. Uh, just and, and what we were, you know, and it's been interesting. To see the scientific community, uh, the astronomers, particularly the physicists, who would really never talk much about the Big Bang, well, the Big Bang is now pretty well accepted, and uh, they're not even too concerned about what happened prior to the Big Bang. There was something there, some creator that did something, and uh, even Stephen Hawking, who is pretty ag agnostic, is saying, well, okay, there had to be something for the Big Bang to have come from. That's all now generally accepted. Twenty years ago, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in the semiconductor world, uh, we have a thing called Moore's Law, where the capacity and the speed of semiconductors doubles every two years, which has given rise to bigger and bigger and more complex semiconductors. <coughs> well, I think we'll end up in a space version of Moore's Law mm -hmm. without too many more years down the road where we are able to... Um, accumulate knowledge at that kind of a rate and, and understand more and more about the creation of the universe and, and then, you know, where is it going and are we the only universe? There's, we have the tools now, I think, to explore some of those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, even a great mind like Einstein, who now everybody has finally decided was right about almost everything. <laughs> he was in disrepair, disrepute for a long time because they couldn't, they couldn't uh, Prove right. some of his theories. Well, we got spacecraft way out there. <coughs> a couple of them launched by Jupiter C, by the way, way back when, mm -hmm. or Redstone. And they were able to do some experiments on bending of light and everything uh, going through uh, heavy masses. He's been absolutely right on almost everything he postulated. So, how many more Einsteins do we have now that have got the ability, the mm -hmm. computational and scientific ability to? to think up things like that and be absolutely right about it. It's uh, going to be an amazing future. It's exciting. <laughs> it is. It is. I think we've only begun. We've yeah. really only just begun. Well, well, thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure. It's wonderful to hear your, <laughs> to hear your story and how that was, you know, that was a hard struggle to get oh. through those, those first steps, uh, those immediate steps. Well, I was trial and error. Of course, yeah. I was in the consulting business for the last uh, 23 years of my career. And um, in organizational change management, uh, actually behavioral enterprise dynamics and change. And uh, one of the things that uh, we always try to tell our clients was, you know, no is an acceptable answer. 
a lot of manufacturing uh, programs these days, zero defects, 100% efficient. Well, that's not the real world. It, nothing is ever 100%. And uh, statistics, a lot of readiness metrics in the military, or I'm 100% ready to go 100% of the time. Well, no, you're not. And you don't want to be. But uh, no is hard for modern management to accept. But if you don't fail a lot a little, you don't learn a lot big time. Right. And that was one of the main things our company believed in is you're permitted to fail a lot a little as long as you learn and don't do the same mistake twice. Now, the definition of a lot and a little sort of got <laughs> tweaked as we went along. That was sort of a you know an ongoing process. But the idea was that you got to be willing to take some risks and, and, and be willing to fail. I think that's excellent advice. And, and unfortunately, a lot of management and our government doesn't think too much about that either. That's another mistake. But we ought to be able to fail a lot a little and, and not have a big penalty. Mm -hmm. Not have a big penalty. And in program management in the military right now, if you fail, you get sent to, you know, ADAC Alaska for the rest of your career. Well, that's not the, that's not a way to innovate. That's not a way to propagate technology. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot by failing, probably more by failing than by winning. Mm -hmm. So, but the mindset is you can't fail. Well, I think that's kind of wrong. You got to be able to fail. So that would be some advice to young folk when they get to be managers: let your people fail a little bit. Right. Take those risks. Take the risk. Take you got to take the risk. Sure do. <laughs> well, thank you very well, much. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yeah. I enjoyed this.